Two different games of chance can be played at a charity fundraiser. In each game, the player spins an arrow on a wheel and wins the amount shown on the sector that the arrow stops in. Each game is fair in that the arrow is just as likely to stop in one sector as in any other sector on that wheel. So in game A, you can see that we have five sectors, so the arrow is equally likely to stop in, one, you know, say the zero euro sector as it is to stop on the five euros sector, um, and so on. John played game A four times and tells us that he has won a total of eight euros. So how many ways can that happen? Well, okay, all the different ways are listed here. For one thing, six euros cannot have happened. Because if the arrow stopped at six euros, well, you know, in order to get a total of eight, um, we would have to have two. Say zero, zero, that's one possibility. And of course, the number two is not on this wheel. Another option, of course, is six, one, one followed by a zero, but you know, there's no one on that wheel, so six cannot appear, and also three cannot appear twice, because if three appears twice, well, that's a six, and we have the same problem as before, we would need two ones, and there's no one, or we would need a two, followed by a zero, and there's no two. Okay, so you can see that um, only five and three can appear, and they can only appear once. Uh, 5 cannot appear twice, obviously, because 5 and 5 is 10. That's too big. Okay, so numbers 5 and 3 appear once, and the other two numbers must be zeros. So we have a total of 8. So basically, we want to see how many different ways we can ar arrange four objects, given that two of them are the same. Well, if all four objects were different, you know, we would have four factorial different ways of arranging them. So four ways for the first, three ways for the second, two ways for the third, and just one way for the fourth. And we just multiply all those together, four by three by two by one. So that would give us four factorial. That's if they were all different. But two of them are the same, so, you know, we've, we've got too many by calculating four factorial. So we have to divide out by the number of ways of arranging the two that are identical. That's the two zeros. Okay, and there's two factorial ways of doing that. 2 factorial is just 2. So we're just dividing 4 factorial by 2. So that's uh, 24 over 2, which is 12. To spin either arrow once, the player pays 3 euros. Which game of chance would you expect to be more successful in raising funds for the charity? Let's start with game A. So let x be the random variable that our arrow lands at a 0, 3, 5, or 6. Those are the only four possibilities. So what are the probabilities associated with these values? Well, zero appears twice, and uh, the total number of outcomes here is five. So the probability that arrow lands on a zero is two out of the total, which is five. As for number three, well, that appears just once out of five equally likely possibilities. So the probability that x equals three is one-fifth. Similarly for x equals 5 and x equals 6. So x is the winnings, okay, when this arrow is spinned just once. And the expected value of those winnings, expected value of x, is got by multiplying all the possibilities that x can have by the corresponding probability. So the player could win 0 euros with probability 2 fifths, or 3 euros with probability 1 fifth, or 5 euros with probability 1 fifth, or six euros with probability one-fifth. So all we're doing is using this formula here. We're multiplying all the values that x can take on by the corresponding probability. So little x is a particular element of the set big X, okay? Little x is an element of big X. Um, so we're multiplying them and sigma means we're summing our results. So we have that on average, when a player spins um, the arrow in for game A, he or she wins two and four fifth euros. Now remember, to play the game, the player paid three euros. So the expected amount given to charity is the amount that the player pays, um, you know, minus the amount that the expected amount that the player wins. So on average, the player will end up paying one-fifth of a euro, that's 20 cent, to charity.
from game A. Now let's look at game B. So let x be the random variable that the arrow lands on, you know, one of these six sectors. So x can take on one of these six values. So these are possible winnings for a single game of game B. By the way, this x is obviously different from our previous x. I could have called it y, but it doesn't matter. So let's look at the corresponding probabilities for x to take on each of these values. So the probability that takes x takes on value 0, well, that's 1 over 6, because we have 6 sectors here, and they're all equally likely. So it's 1 out of 6. As for the number 1, that's also 1 out of 6. And uh, for the other values, it's 1 over 6. So x is the winnings from a single spin of game B, and the expected value of those winnings, the expected value of x, is got by multiplying each possible outcome by the corresponding probability. So, you know, um, 0 um, euros is 1 with probability 1 sixth, 1 euro is 1 with probability 1 sixth, and so on. So we just multiply all these and sum the results. So, we get the expected value of x is 2.5 euros, or 2 euros 50 cent. So that means that the expected amount paid to charity is 3 minus 2.5, so 3 euros to play the game and on average winnings of two and a half. So on average, half a euro or 50 cent is paid to charity for each game of game B. So, you know, um, so game B is more successful in raising funds for the charity. So it's a half a euro as opposed to the previous game, which was only one fifth of a euro. Mary plays game B six times. Find the probability that the arrow stops in the four euro sector exactly twice. Okay, so these are all the possible outcomes for one of the six games. And we saw that for wheel B, each of these outcomes is equally likely. So there, we have six of them, so the probability of each of these outcomes is one-sixth. Let the random variable x be the number of times the arrow stops at the four euro sector. So, um, there are six games, so here are all the possible values that x could have. During the six games, our arrow may not stop at the four euro sector, so x could be zero. During the six games, the arrow could stop exactly once at the four euro sector, exactly once, so that's a possibility and so on, up to a total of six. It's possible that, that the arrow could stop at the four euro sector exactly six times. X follows a binomial distribution because we have six Bernoulli trials. Okay, so each trial is a spin of the arrow and the probability that its arrow stops at zero is one sixth. The probability that it does not stop at zero is five sixths. So it either stops at zero or it doesn't. So we've six Bernoulli trials, the probability of a su success is one sixth. So here are our two parameters. So success in our case is the arrow pointing at zero. Um, okay, so the probability that x equals r, or r is any of these numbers, is given by this formula here. And uh, it's, intuitively this makes sense as we've seen before. Now we want our arrow to point at four euro sector exactly twice. So we just fill two in for R here, N is six. So the probability of success is one sixth to the power of two. Uh, one minus P is the probability of a failure, which is five sixths. That's the probability that the arrow does not stop at a four euro sector. And uh, N minus R six minus two is four here. So again, as a reminder of this formula, without going through all this complicated looking notation, you know, you could work this problem out. Um, you want the number four to appear twice, you know, if number four appears twice at the start of this game, um, the probability of that happening is one sixth times one sixth. The probability of getting a four at the start is one sixth. The probability of getting a four at the second game is also one sixth. Now we want to get a 4 exactly twice, so all the other numbers must not be 4s. They can be anything other than 4s. And the probability of getting numbers other than a 4 is 5 sixths. Okay, so I'm not going to fill in these 4 numbers. They can be anything other than 4s. And of course, 
these numbers can be repeated. You could have four ones here, for example, or any combination of all the other numbers other than fours. So that's one possibility, and that's shown here. Just we just multiply all these probabilities because we have six independent events. Okay, each spin of that arrow is independent of the previous spin. So this part of the formula certainly makes sense. Um, but of course, this is only one possibility. So we have to consider all the different ways that we can get two fours. The two fours do not have to appear at the beginning. So let's consider six spaces for our six games. Um, so, you know, we need to put place our two fours anywhere on this. So as we saw before, we imagined putting the two fours at the beginning, but of course that's just one possibility. We could have a four here and a four here, for example, and so on. So we have many different possibilities. So how many do we have in total? Well, that's just the same as saying how many ways can we choose two of these spaces from six spaces. That's a combinations problem. So the answer is six choose two. So, you know, like, if it was just picking a space, we'd have six ways to pick the first space. Um, and because there's five spaces left, we'd f have five ways to pick the second space. But because the order doesn't matter, we divide by the number of ways we can arrange those two fours. Well, that's just two factorial, or two by one. But this is just the definition of six choose two. Okay, so for example, let's suppose we put our four here and our four here, and we want the other spaces to be occupied by numbers that are not fours. So the probability of not getting a four at the start must be five sixths. The probability of getting a four for the second game must be one sixth. The probability of getting a number that's not four for the third game is five sixths and so on, one sixth here, five sixths here, and finally five sixths at the end. And you can see that we, since we have independent events, we just multiply all of these together. So the probability of getting this particular combination, fours in these positions and numbers that are not four in the remaining position, is given by this thing. So it doesn't matter where we place the two fours, each possibility has a probability given by this thing, because we'll have one sixth appearing twice and five sixths appearing four times and we're multiplying everything together. And, uh, you know, then we just add up all those probabilities. Okay, because we could have this situation or we could have a situation where the four is say here and the four is here, or we could have another situation with two fours in different places. So um, we have to add all the probabilities and we six choose two of them. So we multiply this thing here by six choose two. And that works out to be 0 0.2. Blood tests are sometimes used to indicate if a person has a particular disease. Sometimes such tests give an incorrect result, either indicating the person has the disease when they actually do not, that's called a false positive result, or indicating that they do not have the disease when they actually do, and that's called a false negative result. It is estimated that 0.3% of a large population have a particular disease. So that means that if we randomly select a person from this large population, the probability is 0.3% or 0 0.003 that that person actually has this disease. A test developed to detect the disease gives a false positive in 4% of tests. Um, this actually means in 4% of those tested who do not have the disease, okay? And 4% uh, is the probability that such a person is told that they have the disease, okay? And uh, the test gives a false negative in 1% of tests. So this means that 1% um, of those who actually do have the disease are told that they don't have it as a result of this test. So the probability is 1% that a person randomly selected from all of those people that do have the disease are told that they actually don't. So again, it's a false result. So basically, we have to calculate all of these probabilities. So let's um, write down all of these events. 
Okay, so let D be the event that the person has a disease. Well, this particular disease. And uh, we're given that 0.3% of the population has the disease. So the probability that a randomly selected person has this disease is 0 0.003. Now let D bar be the probability, or the event I should say, that a person does not have this disease. So the probability of that event is 1 minus 0 0.003. Because a person randomly selected either has the disease or does not have the disease. There are no other possibilities. So that means that these two probabilities must add to 1. Let T be the event that a person tests positive for the disease. And T bar be the event that a person tests negative for the disease. Now again, of course, the probability that a person tests positive plus the probability that a person does not test positive must equal 1. So either a person tests positive or uh, does not test positive. That means test negative. Um, so there are only two possibilities, so the probabilities must sum to 1. Now let's look at the false positives. So basically we're looking at all of those people who do not have the disease. Okay, that's event D bar. So event D bar occurs if the randomly selected person from the large population does not have the disease. And we're interested in the proportion of the people who do not have the disease who test positive. Okay, so they're told that they actually have the disease and turns out that they don't. So that proportion is 0 0.04. So that was the 4% given in the question. Okay, let's look at false negatives. So now we're looking at all of those people who actually do have the disease. So we're conditioning on the fact that they do have the disease. So event D has occurred, which means that a randomly selected person has the disease. And uh, a test is done, and we're interested in the proportion of those who are told that they don't have the disease. In other words, event T bar has occurred for them. So we get that from, that's a given Okay, we're given that it's 1%. So the probability is 1% or 0 0.01. Or we could say that the proportion of people who do have the disease that are told that they test negative is 1%. So 1% of the people who, are, who do have the disease and are tested are told that they don't have the disease. Okay, so let's fill in this diagram here. So we have a randomly selected person. The probability that they have the disease is 0.3% or 0 0.003. And 1 minus 0 0.03 or 0.997 is the probability that that person does not have the disease. Now what we want here is the probability that the person tests positive given that they have the disease. So we're looking at this group of people that have the disease. That's 0 0.003 of the population. Actually, we haven't calculated this yet, so I'll go on and do this bit here. So we want the probability that they test negative, that's T bar, conditioning on the fact that they have the disease. So we're only looking at those people that have the disease. So that's what we have here, 0 0.01. So how do we answer this bit? Well, it turns out that these two probabilities add to 1. Because if you think about it, if a person has the disease, either they test positive, are they test negative? There are no other possibilities. So the sum of these probabilities must be 1. So this probability must be 0.99. Okay, because we're conditioning on the same event in both cases. And we have probability t or probability uh, not t. Okay, so what do we want here? Well, here we want the probability that this random person has the disease and tests positive. So that can be written as P of D intersecting T. And that's just got by multiplying these two probabilities together. So just as a reminder, for conditional probability, say this thing here, probability of T given D, we have to calculate the probability of the intersection of the two events. That's the probability that both events occur. And divide that by the probability of the event that's conditioned on, which is D. Okay, the, the event that's conditioned on appears in the denominator. 
So if we just cross multiply here, we'll get the probability of D intersecting TR, well that's just the same as T intersecting D of course, I just have it written the other way around. Doesn't matter about the order of two events, you know, when we're talking about the intersection of course. Okay, so we just multiply these. Similarly here, we want the probability that the random person has the disease and tests negative. Okay, so um, that's the pro you know, we can get it from this formula again of course. You know, probability T bar given D is this thing here, which is what we're after actually. That's what we want here. I've just written it the other way around. So just cross multiply again. Okay, so what do we want here? Well, um, the person tests positive, so we want the probability that the person tests positive given that they do not have the disease. So we have that here, so that's the false positive rate. It's point zero. Down here we want the probability that um, the test is negative, given that the person does not have the disease. So again, you see we're conditioning on the same event here, D and D, uh, D bar. Okay, we're conditioning on the same event. So if that's the case, the person either tests positive or tests negative. We don't have any other options. So you know these two probabilities must add up to one. So we're looking at the population of people who um, don't have the disease. And we're just getting the proportion of those who don't have the disease that test positive. And uh, we want the proportion of those who don't have the disease who do not test positive. Well, that's 1 minus 0 0.04 or 0.96. Okay, so finally we want the probability that a person tests positive and does not have the disease. So, you know, we just multiply these probabilities together. So that just comes out of our conditional probability formula. Okay, so I've written our conditional probability formula for events T and D bar. D bar is the event condition and it appears in the denominator. Uh, so we cross multiply to get a probability T intersecting D bar. And of course we have a similar result here, we just multiply these probabilities to get the probability that the person does not have the disease, that's D bar, and does not test positive. In other words, they test negative. Next we want to calculate the probability that a person selected at random from the population tests positive for the disease. In other words, we want the probability of event T. Now here we have a case of the theorem of or law of total probability that we saw previously. So event T occurs if either T intersecting D or T intersecting D bar occurs. So if you think about it, um, if event T occurs, well, you know, either the person tests positive and they have the disease, or the person is test positive and they don't have the disease. So there's no other possibilities if you think about it. So, you know, we can calculate this by, this, the probability of T occurring is the, the sum of the probabilities of these events, because it's an or situation, you know, we add the probabilities. So, um, so there are two cases, T intersecting D or uh, T intersecting D bar. Two and only two cases that cover all the possibilities for T to occur. So we just go to our table here and get those two results. So we want to take this number and uh, add it to this one here. Notice by the way that these four possibilities cover all the possibilities for a randomly selected person. Okay, so that means that the probabilities associated with all these events, you know, D intersecting T, D intersecting T bar, and so on, must add up to one. So that's another way to, you know, check all these values. A person tests positive for the disease. What is the probability that the person actually has the disease? So we want the probability that the person has the disease, so we want the probability of D. But what is this conditioned on? This is conditioned on the fact that the person tests positive. So we want the probability D given that T has occurred. Well, we can just use our definition of um, conditional probability, so we get the probability of the intersection of these two events, and divide by the probability of the event that's conditioned on. So the T appears in the denominator. So we just go back up here, we have 
the probability of the intersection of the two events, 0 0.00297. And we have the probability of T, 0 0.04285. Notice how small this number is. This number is approximately 0 0.07 or 7%. So the person has tested positive for the disease. So if they didn't know any better, um, they might assume that they have the disease or there's a very high chance that they have the disease. But the probability that they have the disease is actually small. So this means that the probability that they don't have the disease, even though they test positive, is 1 minus this number. So even though they test positive, there's a 93% probability that they don't actually have the disease. Again, these two probabilities must add up to one, because we're conditioning on the same event. That's the event that the person tests positive. And we're looking at the event that the person either has the disease or does not have the disease. So these are the only two possibilities. They either have the disease or they don't have the disease. So these probabilities must add up to one. So to sum up, we could say that this test is not that effective. As an aside, intuitively, we might expect to, you know, increase this probability by lowering the false positive rate, okay? So, false positive rate was 4%. That seems quite low as it is, but apparently it's not low enough. Um, if we go back here to this thing that we just calculated, you know, in the denominator, we've probability of t, well, we saw how to calculate that. We just add these two probabilities here. Um, and if we look at the second probability, we can write it like this here. And this quantity here is the false positive rate. This quantity is 4% or 0 0.04. So notice that this thing on top and this thing underneath are the same. So if you divide this by this, you get 1. So obviously we want uh, this probability that we just calculate it to be as close to 1 as as possible. So, you know, if a person tests positive, we want the probability that they have the disease to be as close to 1 as possible. And uh, that will happen if all of this thing here is as close to 0 as possible. So one way to make this thing 0 is to make the false positive rate as close to 0 as possible. So even though it's quite low at 4%, it's still not low enough. Now, of course, you could say that we could uh, make this thing as close to zero as possible. Well, there's nothing we can do about that. This is just a probability that a person doesn't have the disease. We have no control over that.